thank you so much for the invitation. So, um, uh, as you said, uh, I'm an assistant professor uh, at the University of Utah, where I'm also the associate director of our medical intensive care unit. Um, I'm a practicing intensivist and so have had too much experience, I think, um, treating our severely ill COVID-19 patients. Um, I do have one disclosure, the University of Utah does have financial interest in one of these novel um, net inhibitors that we used in our publication. So a little bit of background about me and my work. Um, as a pulmonary and critical care fellow, I was fortunate enough to join the lab of Dr. Matthew Rondina. And the central theme of our work is we look at um, pathogens and infectious syndromes and how they can reprogram the megakaryocyte, alter the um, RNA uh, profile, how those RNAs are then invested into developing platelets. Those, pla those um, RNAs are then um, excuse me, those platelets are then released into the circulation where they, they can then transcribe, um, uh, translate the <laughs> new proteins that result in functionally different um, platelets where they can interact with cell types, um, uh, thereby um, leading to different heterotypic aggregate formation, um, increased platelet activation, et cetera. So this is a trip down memory lane for all of us and induced a bit of trauma, I think. Um, back in January, when we first started hearing about uh, SARS-CoV-2, at least in Utah, is when we were starting to talk about it and doing our initial preparations. Uh, Wuhan uh, first reported this cluster of pneumonia cases in December. Shortly after that, not even a month, they published the first COVID-19 sequences. And then I'm not sure if you guys did this, but I certainly did. In February, I started looking at the Johns Hopkins map. Um, Thailand was the first case outside of China to report uh, the SARS-CoV-2 pneumonia. Italy uh, shortly after that, and then they induced their national quarantine in Mar on March 9th. The WHO announced uh, this was a global pandemic on March 11th. And the USA locally um, in Washington, they announced their first case on January 20th. And New York uh, announced its first case on March 1st and then shortly followed a statewide lockdown on March 20th. And then the terrible um, spring uh, pandemic uh, onset into the city. We in Utah had the benefit of a delayed um, onset of the pandemic. We shut down. Uh, mid-March, the entire city and state, um, but the, our cases remained low until July, we saw an uptick. Um, this is just marching through, watching the case counts go up, uh, looking a month ago at our global cases, and you guys have seen all of this <laughs> uh, done more elegantly than I, and then just looking at this again yesterday, just the case counts continue to march upwards. Um, the clinical manifestations of COVID-19, and this is what I see on a day-to-day -day basis, um, is typically that of pneumonia and hypoxic respiratory failure. Overall, we've seen our hospitalization rate across the U.S. decline. Um, the CDC reported a 50% reduction this last week compared to the week prior to that, and it continues to disproportionately impact our minority populations as compared to a white population. Um, and again, we see that here um, in uh, Utah as well. And ICU admissions range um, broadly from 2% of all cases up to nearly 40% of all those hospitalized. And the primary reason they come to the ICU is for hypoxemic respiratory failure manifested as acute respiratory distress syndrome. Um, the key difference that we see with um, the COVID-19 pneumonia is that these patients are severely hypoxemic. The presentation varies widely. It can happen within a couple of days and rapidly progress to a prolonged onset. So a couple of weeks after initial 
diagnosis. But when they do come to the ICU, they are there for a long amount of time. So their prolonged hospitalization as compared to influenza up to a three times longer stay in the ICU, which is why as it has resulted into a consumption of resources um, and why we saw such a use of um, hospital beds, a lack of ICU beds and a loss of um, availability of ventilator and staff, et cetera. We saw that locally as I'm sure that you guys all are aware of happened in New York as well. Another um, uh, issue when caring for COVID-19 patients um, in addition to uh, consuming a lot of resources was separating fact from fit fiction. There was a lot of mistrust from our patients um, and families, not only because there was a disbelief in um, COVID existing, um, but also because there's a lot of uh, limitations in communication, either because of non-English speaking, because of visitation policies, families couldn't come to the hospital. Also just um, a denial and fear because of what um, uh, COVID was discussed in the, in the media so much. Um, that people were more aware and more fearful of what this meant as, a, as the disease. And then there was rampant misinformation on social media and as people were are spreading this amongst family members, et cetera, and other uh, forms of uh, information passing. And then there were rapid changes in what sort of treatment was available and then uh, results of clinical trials have come out. And that's that's become difficult to keep a handle on. We see that we're a large uh, referral center. Um, we serve um, five different states and as ICU beds are running out in other states, uh, many patients are being referred to us and therefore different practice patterns were coming from other smaller um, ICUs and smaller hospitals. Um, and so we saw there's been changes in recommendations. The, the classic one was hydroxychloroquine that was initially thought to be, um, it might have some benefit. Uh, however, that was quickly uh, found not to be beneficial. Then there was also monoclonal antibodies we had some hope for, um, and there might still be some hope in specific settings. Remdesivir, we also had some hope for, but that is only um, to be used for select populations now and, and less of our critically ill populations. Same with dexamethasone. And then anticoagulation, that is the most recent one as press releases have come out um, from the active uh, for trial. Uh, but we're still waiting for the uh, publication of those results. And then the questions still remain as far as system processes, and these go through the ICU communities and professional societies about the correct timing of when to employ our additional interventions, such as, such as intubation, um, mechanical ventilation, who is a candidate, and when do we um, put somebody on ECMO, uh, our most advanced type of support. So during all of this rapidly evolving landscape of information, new trials, new medications, um, the answers cannot come soon enough for our patients, the families, and us at the bedside. And this is a shameless plug for myself at the bedside as we are scrambling for answers. We work in the ICU in teams. This is myself with one of our skilled ICU nurses. There's also been a shortage of them. And we've just taken a patient here prone um, that's laying on their belly to help improve the oxygenation status of this person. And we're rotating um, this person's head so they don't get breakdown uh, on their face. And you can tell this, this, this is the ICU, this is the day-to-day -day we see um, the severely ill individual. And then this was one of our first patients that we had that became very, very ill. And these are the, the human stories that impact me. And this is, these are the things that drive questions and, and keep me up at night and make me think, what can we do? How can we, how can we help? Um, these are the individual levels um, that I think the, the lay people and when we look at all the big data and we just talk about mortality that people don't see the, the human stories. 
anyway, this was a 42 year old previously healthy gentleman who went on a family trip to Disneyland early on in the pandemic and um, someone in the car, um, family friend in the car had the, the virus spread it to the entire family. His wife was also hospitalized, um, but she was only in for a couple of days and he progressed to needing ECMO. Luckily he survived um, his ICU hospitalization was there for about three months, but walked out um, and has shared his story uh, broadly with the local news and has come back to be very thankful to our healthcare workers. And it's those sorts of stories that keep us going. But these questions uh, keep us up at night. Um, and that is, why do some people become so severely ill while others remain unscathed? Why does this 42 year old gentleman uh, with no comorbidities get so sick while a 92 year old with diabetes and cancer <laughs> can walk out of the hospital? <laughs> Um, and why do those that become critically ill suffer so significant, so much more significantly? And why do those that develop progressive respiratory failure go on to die? Is it a consequence of our interventions? Are we too late? Is it a freight train that we just cannot stop? Can it be just a result of all these iatrogenic complications? I don't think so because um, so many of our others with other illnesses that we put on the chemical ventilations come through and survive. And then most importantly, are there areas that we can target to prevent progression of disease? Particularly once they get to the ICU and that, is, that has been a, a key thing for me. Um, one area that I'm interested in because of my background in platelet research is thrombosis and COVID. Here's another image of one of our patients. You can see in this, um, uh, coronal section of a CAT scan that he's got diffuse ground glass opacities, uh, bilateral lung fields, and in that area is pulmonary artery. He's got a thrombus that has developed. This is an image of um, uh, what has been called COVID toes, and that is uh, showing these microvascular uh, thrombi uh, occurring in the smaller um, uh, beds. And then these are just headlines captured from the lay press about a mysterious blood clotting complication killing coronavirus patients. And then these other young and middle-aged people barely sick with COVID-19 are dying of strokes. And so this has been um, widely reported now that these arterial and venous thrombosis are observed in COVID-19 patients. I remember being on a call early on in the pandemic um, with researchers from across the country and those based at NYU looking at autopsy um, results. Uh, this was led by Amy Rapskowitz and her results were published um, in eClinical Medicine earlier in 2020. And she was finding um, megakaryocytes deposited in huge numbers in the lungs. And it is common to find megakaryocytes deposited in the lungs, but the numbers were markedly increased and then even uh, deposited in myocardium. And then uh, they were also seeing things like increased market of troponin. And we do see that commonly in the critically ill, but was this uh, a symbol or sign that there was increased uh, thrombosis occurring in these COVID patients? And then since that time, there's been multiple autopsy series that show that there are thrombi in the pre-capillary and post post capillary vessels and other reports of thromboembolic rates um, that are coming out um, and they vary as widely as 30 to 70%. And that can be because of differences in availability of testing and detection in these patients. And then there are mixed reports on if neutrophils are contributing to uh, these thrombi or if they are actually signifying a secondary bacterial process um, in these patients. So the potential mechanisms of thrombosis in COVID is quite uh, complicated and I'm not gonna go into all those details because we do not have time for that, nor do I have the expertise for that. So I'm going to focus a bit on just the platelets and the neutrophils as we've seen in some of our work. So our initial hypothesis when we first looked at um, these COVID uh, patients was, does COVID cause alterations in the platelet physiology and does that contribute to the pathogenesis of COVID-19? 
So what we did is we prospectively enrolled COVID patients in both the non-ICU, so these are acutely ill hospitalized patients, as well as ICU COVID-19 patients um, uh, and uh, some healthy donors. And as you can see, they, um, our ICU population and our uh, non-ICU population were not significantly different with the exception of our ICU population was slightly older. They were more likely to have diabetes. Only our ICU population could have um, mechanical ventilation. And there was about a 35% um, mortality rate in our ICU population and none of our um, hospitalized non-ICU patients died. Interestingly, um, the platelet counts in our COVID patients were within normal limits. We did not see thrombocytopenia. And it has been shown that those that are profoundly thrombocytopenic do have worse outcomes. But again, our, our population was not thrombocytopenic and they did not have a profound leukocytosis. So we performed uh, RNA-seq analysis on the platelets from these uh, patients and you can see uh, there was uh, global differences in the transcriptome uh, in the platelets of COVID-19 uh, patients as compared to healthy donors. And this is looking at a total of 10 COVID patients, four ICU and six non-ICU. About 3,000 genes in total were altered, 1,700 were upregulated, and about 1,300 were downregulated. Um, we wondered if this was a direct effect of the um, SARS-CoV-2 virus. However, we did not see the ACE2 receptor on COVID-19 patients, excuse me, platelets, um, but we were able to detect the SARS-CoV-2 N1 gene in two of 25 patients. So what that is, uh, we're not quite sure that would require some further investigation. We then looked at soluble markers of platelet activation. Um, D-dimer is not a marker of platelet activation. However, we did want to recapitulate that what others had shown. And we did see that there were increased markers of um, uh, elevation of D-dimer. Uh, VWF, PF1, RANTES are all markers of uh, platelet granule release. And those were all elevated in the plasma of COVID-19 uh, patients. So um, showing that our platelets are more reactive. We then wanted to look at platelet functional studies. So this is light transmission aggregation. And as you can see here with a variety of ag agonists, Tumes ADP, thrombin and collagen, at different concentrations, we do see um, increased uh, light transmission aggregation. The red line um, is the COVID-19 patients and you do see more uh, light transmission aggregation there. So increased classic functional um, responses in platelets from COVID-19 uh, patients. However, platelets do more than just classic um, functional responses. They also have immune roles. And this is more and more recognized in the literature. So platelets can form these heterotypic aggregates, particularly with monocytes. It's been shown that they can increase uh, tissue factor uh, secretion with monocytes. And so we looked at the formation of heterotypic aggregates in our COVID-19 patients. And we indeed, we did see that platelet monocyte aggregates were increased, as well as platelet CD4 T cell aggregates, platelet CD8 T cell aggregates, and platelet neutrophil aggregates were increased in our um, uh, COVID-19 patients. So in summary here, I'll sh I've shown you that the platelets uh, have an altered gene expression. They have increased platelet uh, reactivity and classic uh, platelet functional responses, and they have increased platelet leukocyte uh, interactions. We then um, were fortunate enough to collaborate with another uh, group um, that we work closely with, and we wanted to explore whether or not neutrophils interacted um, to contribute to immunothrombosis in COVID-19. So sorry, they're replacing my furnace today. Um, so neutrophil extracellular traps are present in COVID-19. As you guys, I'm sure are aware, neutrophil extracellular traps are these lattice structures that are comprised of decondensed DNA studded with histones, antimicrobial proteins, and enzymes. These have been known to contribute to thrombi 
as has been described by Denise Wagner's group uh, since 2010. And early on in the pandemic, Zo et al. published markers of increased nets in the serum of COVID-19 platelets. Um, we were fortunate enough to collaborate with Nicola Egovlad from Cold Springs Harbor, who had performed autopsy series and had found that um, there were presence of these clusters of neutrophils, these beautiful images here. The red staining is myeloperoxidase, which is a neutrophil marker. The green staining is citrullinated histone H3, which is extracellular DNA, um, which is um, what we think is the nets. Um, and the DAPI is the, neutro, uh, is the nuclear stain. And the case three on the far right hand screen seems to appear to be in a vessel. And this is a zoomed in picture. Again, I just really wanted to emphasize the green staining here is the citrullinated histone three, the extracellular DNA, which looks like it's uh, forming these uh, netosis in this autopsy lung tissue. So we looked in our um, case series, in our uh, patient series here, for plasma markers of uh, net formation using this MPO DNA uh, LISA. And we found that in our COVID patients, uh, the more severely ill patients had increased markers of NETS. So our intubated patients, again, our more um, severely ill patient with respiratory failure had increased markers of NETS. And interestingly, those patients that went on to survive and recover from their illness, so greater than 90 days, had decreased um, uh, uh, markers of NETS that returned back to healthy levels. Interestingly, from those patients that we were able to get tracheal aspirates from and check those for markers of NETS, we saw increased markers of NETS in that um, as well as um, in the plasma. So suggesting that NETS are contributing both potentially in the vessels as well as in the alveolar space. Also, the plasma net seemed to correlate with the degree of hypoxemic respiratory failure. So the PaO2 to FiO2 ratio is what we use to look at the severity of respiratory failure. The lower the number, the more severe the respiratory failure. And as you can see, the increase in MPO DNA complexes, the lower the PF ratio. And again, um, over on the graph on the right, um, our patients that did not survive the hospitalization had increased markers of NETS in their serum. Uh, interestingly, the neutrophils from the COVID patients seem to be primed to undergo netosis. So when we did uh, flow cytometry looking at the baseline neutrophil granularity, the COVID patients had decreased uh, granularity as compared to healthy donors. And when we look at confocal micros microscopy of their um, neutrophils under just baseline unstimulated conditions, the panels, the two panels on the left-hand side there, the control neutrophils um, appear quiescent. And then the COVID-19 neutrophils without any stimulation are spontaneously undergoing netosis. And then when stimulated with PMA, the healthy donor neutrophils undergo netosis as well as the COVID-19. However, if you look at the panel uh, for quantification, the COVID-19, once they're stimulated with PMA, do not, um, do not uh, create nets to the same degree as the healthy donors, suggesting that they're already spontaneously undergoing netosis. Again, this is just another uh, beautiful image just another beautiful image from the autopsy specimens from the COVID-19 patients. This one is looking at the presence of platelets interacting with these uh, neutrophils. The center panel is really the blown up um, image. Uh, we were limited on the number of channels we could show here, but this appears to be within a vessel. The gray this time is the myeloperoxidase, the neutrophil marker. Green is the citrullinated histone H3. You can see the um, extracellular DNA staining there. And this time red is the platelet factor four. So platelets are surrounding these um, neutrophils that appear to be undergoing netosis. So this immunothrombus is forming within uh, what appears to be a vessel there. 
Um, so could there potentially be a role for inhibition of nets in uh, COVID or other disease processes? Potentially, um, our lab is working on or has been looking at this novel inhibitor of um, uh, nets. And when we look at uh, COVID-19 plasma, it seems to induce uh, nets in healthy PMNs. You can see in the panel on the far left, those are healthy donor PMNs healthy donor plasma, minimal um, net formation there. And then when you take COVID-19 plasma and put it on healthy donor leukocytes, then net formation is induced. And this is inhibited by this novel uh, net inhibitor and not so much, and not inhibited by the uh, scramble peptide. So in summary, what I hope I've shown you is that uh, platelets are increased have increased function in uh, COVID-19, that nets and immunothrombosis seems to play a role in um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. And this maybe adds at least part of the puzzle of uh, COVID-19 uh, pneumonia and uh, the severity of illness that we are seeing in our patients. And I'd just like to thank my colleagues um, Dr. Robert Campbell, um, Bonnie uh, Mann, and Frederick Norm, and Mark Cody, so much uh, for all their help with this. And that's what I have. Elizabeth, thank you so much for that. That is, that is <laughs> scary to hear, but good to hear. Um, so one thing I didn't know is the platelet abnormalities that you're seeing, are these, you know, common? Are they, are they, all patients are showing this or only the severely people in respiratory failure? Um, is it, in other words, and also it, could this be prognostic or diagnostic? Uh, uh, clarify which, which part, which? The... Well, you know, all the readouts that you're seeing of, of platelet abnormalities, is, is it really universal or only the, the severely affected? So the RNA-seq profiling, the changes that we saw was both on the not severely ill, so the moderately ill hospitalized, as well as the severely ill. So it seems to be globally transcriptional changes in both populations. So it didn't seem to change. And then the functional response we did in both the hospitalized acutely ill and as well as the ICU, and the degree of aggregation response was not different. Okay. So I'm just trying to get a sense of whether this is something one looks at when people first present and, and it's helpful or whether it's just something that you see, you know, as a part of the phenotype, I, you know. Yeah, we haven't, I haven't delved um, into more detail to see like if there's increased, um, like the degree of heterotypic aggregates changes in the more severely ill or how that changes during the course of their disease in the ICU, that would be, that would be another interesting point to look at. Thanks.